All right, y'all, what's up? Welcome back to the show. We're talking about beer today. I think this is going to be a fun video. This is why does American beer taste like water? <laughs> uh, look, I'm just going to preface this with, uh, yeah, it's it could be a little bland or a little odd. I think it's good. It depends on the brand. I tend to go for Coors. Uh, they're my favorite American brand. I think they're good. I don't really mess with the others so much. Uh, and of course, um, Modelo from uh, Mexico is readily available here as well. Modelo is really good. I do love their beer as well. Uh, but other than that, you know, American beer tastes like water. That's a pretty broad statement, right? Uh, if you're a tourist here, I would go for local brews. So, you know, local breweries, microbreweries, craft beers here. Those I've found some stellar, like to die for beers uh, that are on the local level. Uh, not so much this uh, jazzed up, boxed up stuff that you see in the stores everywhere, right? Those I would just stay away from. Uh, yeah, this would be a great video for comments. So I would love to hear where you're watching from. If you're watching from Europe or elsewhere, what are some brands of beers that I need to keep an eye out for that maybe I could try? So yeah, this is going to be a fun one. This is from a channel called The Good Stuff. It'll be linked in the description down below so you can watch the whole thing uninterrupted. And of course, browse their channel. Let's go. Let's okay, we sure do about. like our beer. We're ranked second in the world for overall beer consumption. An honor we've that. earned by tossing back roughly 51 billion pints of suds every single year. And although there are a lot of options to choose from, the style of beer we drink the most by far is the traditional light American lager. Yes. Of course, not far. everyone else in the world loves American beer. We find your American beer is a little like making love in a canoe. It's f***ing close to water. <laughs> very well made beers. These are very high quality beers but they're kind of light on, on beer flavor. This is Ray Daniels, founder of the Cicerone Certification Program in Chicago, longtime brewer nice. and expert beer drinker. Chicago, and the main up? reason is because there's not that much malt in these mm -hmm. recipes. Yeah. And the Germans have a saying that malt is the soul of beer, mm. and there's not that much malt in these beers. But how did a style of beer that's drinkable and refreshing, yet has no soul, get to be so popular? Five reasons. German immigrants, prohibition, brewing technology, World War II, and the post-war consumer packaged goods economy. Wow. But I'm going to get to that in a minute. Excuse me. Could I get a cool, refreshing lager, please? Here is our beer list, okay. categorized by country. Lagers are listed on the left, alphabetically, uh, by sure, variety. Sure, could I, could I, I just course. Thanks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Apricot. Yes, I've seen that. I may have done that before. Why is that? <laughs> I would say, like, for most of American history, this was the kind of beer we were drinking, right? Right, right. Well, it, it really has to do with brewing technology and the migration of German-speaking immigrants coming to the U.S. Between 1850 and 1900, millions of German-speaking immigrants migrated to the United States. Prior to that, British-style ales dominated the beer industry, mm, but the Germans okay. wanted something different. Wanted to make a nice, golden, clear, pale beer, because that was the style of beer in Germany at the time. But American wow. barley, the stuff that grows here in the United States, is different than the barley that grows in oh, Europe. Oh, of course. And they couldn't make a clear beer with American six-row barley because it has a higher protein content. Okay. <sighs> the problem, they were very annoyed. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get clear beer. I mean, I would be pretty annoyed yeah, if I couldn't no, get absolutely. beer. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it didn't look pretty the way it was supposed to. Yeah. So they figured out that if they took a low protein grain, like corn or rice, uh, and mix it into the okay. recipe, that they'd get a lower protein content in the finished beer, and the beer would turn out clear. Mm -hmm. So that was the original reason. It was okay. it was not to make it cheap. It was not you know anything else, but they wanted a nice, clear, golden beer. The Czech style pilsner, okay. which is a type of lager, quickly became the beer of choice. Breweries began popping up all over the place, many of which were owned and operated by German immigrants like Adolf Coors, Frederick Miller, wow. Joseph Schlitz, Frederick Pabst Blue Ribbon, full name, and a soap maker named Eberhard right. Anheuser. The brewing industry in America flourished, and by 1873, the country had over 4,000 breweries. However, wow. this golden age of golden lager would not last long. The boom in the beer industry was accompanied by a boom in other things associated with beer, like public drunkenness and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Then something happened in America that set the brewing industry back a few decades. Yeah. When the 18th Amendment passed in 1919, prohibition in the United States had officially begun. Yeah. The production, transport, and sale of alcohol became illegal, and the beer industry all but ceased to exist, with Dang. the exception of a few industrious entrepreneurs. <laughs> when prohibition was finally repealed in, in 1933, well. only a fraction of the beer manufacturers from the late 1800s remained, and that number continued to drop every year. Strict state laws combined with heavy government regulation made it difficult for smaller beer companies to survive, not to mention the fact that home brewing was still illegal. 
During World War II, grain was rationed in the United States, forcing beer makers to rely more heavily on adjuncts like corn and rice. This slowed the re-emergence of smaller breweries, but allowed bigger, established breweries to flourish. After the war ended, America didn't need to ration anymore, and we began to adopt a more liberal approach to consumption. You know, and then the 20th century was pretty much a century of consumer packaged goods in the United States. We had very narrow media outlets. You know, when I was a kid, there were only three TV stations, mm -hmm. period. I know, ancient history, right? Yeah. Everything got narrowed down to a very small number of brands with universal distribution throughout the country. It was true for soap, breakfast cereal, uh, coffee with Folgers and Maxwell House. I mean, everything got narrowed down to a very small number of consumer brands, and beer was no different. Throughout yeah, the second half of the 20th century, the, the number of independent breweries dwindled, as beer manufacturers merged and companies like Anheuser-Busch and Miller continued to grow. By 1978, the beer-making industry hit a record low, with only around 80 breweries operating in the U.S. No kidding. America's beer wow. got even more watered down when the big beer companies devised a brilliant strategy to sell more beer. Light beer. Yeah. And that's what's funny, is I feel like most people, including myself, from experience, but just uh, observing as well, uh, it's always usually light beer. I'd say 80, 90% of the time, like way up there. Uh, people buy Miller Lite. They don't buy regular Miller. They buy Coors Lite. They don't buy regular Coors. Like, uh, I tend to, tend to split it 50-50. I just sometimes grab Coors, and sometimes I grab Coors Lite. Uh, and I really like both. <laughs> Originally marketed They're unsuccessfully so as a diet drink, opinion. light beers promised the same great taste, but with less filling, right. which basically just encouraged people to drink more. Miller Lite and Bud Light's advertising campaigns were hugely successful and further cemented their dominance of the beer industry. Unless you were one of the millions of Americans who enjoyed bland, watery beer, things were looking pretty bleak. But then a miracle happened. In 1977, Congress passed a small brewer tax credit, and in 1978, a bill was signed into law that finally made home brewing legal throughout the country. Jimmy Carter uh, signed home brewing, one of the other great things Jimmy Carter did. Wow, what a great man. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Home brewing became legal, and home brewing really drove the craft brewing movement. Yes. It was really tough in the early days because there was no equipment. Nobody was selling supplies yeah. uh, to these small breweries. You know, a small brewer might need um, 1,000 pounds of malt. And they call up a malt supplier and they're like, yeah, we'll send you some malt. You know, how many, how many train car loads do you need? I was like, well, how much is a train car? 30,000 pounds. Like, um, uh, can I get a thousand? <laughs> yeah. You know, click. It started slow at first, but over the years, the number of small craft breweries began to steadily increase. So what we're seeing now, what uh, most uh, people think of as the craft uh, movement, the modern one or the second wave really started in about 2003. There were craft brewers out there who'd been sort of sticking to their knitting and really, you know, cleaning up their game and, and getting things good. A new brewery started being founded and we've had this huge you know, upsurge of, of breweries. So there, that's 30 years of craft beer yeah. history in a, in a wow. nutshell. No longer limited to the light lagers yeah. that Americans had been drinking for over a century, right. brewers can now experiment with a variety of styles and flavors, oh, creating sure. new recipes and borrowing from... Yeah, like I said, once compared to these generic, you know, like the big companies that are plastered all over the place, uh, advertised and such, and all over the store shelves, uh, all of these, or when you go to these breweries and these restaurants that have these uh, local craft beers, it's, it's exciting, tradition. at least as an American, because you finally get a lot of different options, lots of different tastes, lots of different um, colors going on. It, it, it's, it's really cool. As well. In 2015, the number of breweries in America reached an all-time high at 4,269, surpassing pre-prohibition numbers. Yeah. Of course, at the same time, after years of mergers and acquisitions, the world's five biggest beer companies now control over 50% of the world's beer market. Wow, look at that. Holy smokes. Though big beer continues to dominate, it does not seem to be slowing down craft beer. And we have more options for beer consumption yes, than ever before. Than ever. This is truly a good time to have a Point. beer. It is a good time good over here in the States. Now, you might be laughing where you're watching from. If you're watching from parts of Europe, you know, if you're watching from Belgium or you're watching from Germany, you're watching from the Czech Republic, you guys have got it made with beer. Uh, and, and I know that. I've learned that. I've uh, more to learn. Uh, but... You know, you guys have an amazing uh, beer consumption culture, lots of amazing beers that I just, when I, my mouth waters when I see videos of them serving fresh beer with all the foam and all going on um, in Germany, in the Czech Republic. It just looks incredible. So there's no doubt that your guys' 
I don't know, like probably have better beer for the most part. And uh, I would really love to partake in that. I'd love to test that out. <laughs> but yeah, it is cool to see how far it's come in the U.S. And uh, remember, you know, don't always judge things on just the generic like, oh, look at the I had Miller Lite or I had Coors and it was so bland, like it was garbage. Yeah. Everyone's different. I tend to think those are okay. But, yeah, they're not craft, you know, master beers. Uh, there is definitely much better options here. You just got to seek them out a little. Like I said, it's going to be a great video for comments. So if you have had any of the American big beers like Coors, Miller, uh, you know, Budweiser, stuff like that, let me know, you know, did you, did you like it? Maybe it was all right. Did you hate it? Did you think it was bland? I would love to hear your opinions on that. And then, of course, uh, some of your favorite beers where you're watching from so I can do some research uh, and or any, you know, beers that you had in the U.S. that were really good that we should know about. I'm all ears. Uh, make sure to throw a like on there if you enjoyed this. Subscribe to be part of this amazing community. This was interesting. It, it was kind of cool to actually see the history there, how it originally developed and, uh, you know, why it became the way it was. It is still bizarre that uh, we kind of have a mixture here. Some people do buy the light name brand beers here and they just keep drinking it and it's, it's, it's whatever, right? And some people do seek out the better beers. Some people buy, you know, foreign beers all the time. It's kind of a mixed bag here. Anywho, thanks for watching again, guys. My name is Ian. You're watching Night W Rocker. And until next time, catch you later, y'all.